cataractcoach.com. Welcome back to our podcast. Today we have episode 17 with Professor Jorge Alio. Professor Alio has been on the forefront, the cutting edge of cataract, refractive, anterior segment, corneal, glaucoma surgery for many, many years. He's based out of Alicante, Spain, and he has done both the private practice, you can see the huge visual center he built, plus he's done the academics and chairman of a department and grown a huge following in his department of ophthalmology. So he's done amazing things in ophthalmology, and he's truly quite a leader in this. In terms of publications, you may be blown away. He has hundreds of peer-reviewed publications, coming on a thousand. So clearly the man has an incredible scientific brain, but also an incredible surgical brain. And we had a great conversation today talking about all things anterior segment surgery. And he's got some great insight as to your future. I bet you'll enjoy. Check it out. So welcome to our Cataract Coach podcast. Today we have Professor Jorge Alio from Alicante, Spain. Professor Alio has done so much in ophthalmology. He is one of the top authors in the history of ophthalmology. Unbelievable. The work ethic is second to none. He's written many books. You see on the podium across the planet, and he's a prolific surgeon, ultra high volume, and has even created an empire of eye surgery there in his hometown. So I want to welcome you, Professor Alio. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation today. It's great to be here, uh, joining colleagues uh, of the States and worldwide, because it's always good. You know, interaction means learning, and it's always positive. It brings a lot of Good vibrations for me. Thank you. For sure. So tell me about your new book. You have a new book with Bobby Osher and Burkhard Dick and you. The three of you have written a new book about cataract surgery. Tell me more about this book. Now, wait, wait, this is the book. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, you know, the, the book has been edited by us because we thought that there was a, a, a place in the in the international literature about <clears throat> a cataract in especially difficult cases and complex situations. Uh, we have, because of the experience of more than 30 years in surgery, the experience in all these topics, but also we have the experience of other surgeons. There are many good surgeons now worldwide in which, uh, based on high volume expertise and talent, they have got a, a innovations and a new approaches in order to solve problems that before were very difficult to solve or been in, impossible. Not only that, we have new technologies that are available that it makes it possible to do things that before were not done in the in a proper way and so we thought that this was the moment to upgrade all this knowledge in a book in which we have contributed each one of us about one third and then they, they, we have got the contributions from other sources that indeed have been tremendously successful we have a, a, a book with with a, with a lot of information but also with a lot of videos your surgery has to be watched right, and obviously yes. you, you cannot watch uh, 20 uh, authors in, in dif- the different places it's impossible today but you can see which is the, their expertise and the way in which they they deal with especially difficult and complex cases in a successful way i have to tell you today that this book is based on evidence it's not based only in, in opinions it's not made based on artistic e- behavior evidence-based evidence-based so whatever you you will uh, read there is because we have the or the author has the evidence has been published with series of cases has been peer review and even the book has been peer reviewed so whatever you see wow. you can see that is a, a peer review process both from the authors and both from the editors and so it's a percolated yeah. information yes give us an example of some of the difficult or challenging or complex cases that uh, that you're talking about in the book you know th- let me tell you two interesting chapters one is about bilinsectomy Today, we, we started implanting a fake girls about 30 years ago, and obviously many of these patients have cataract or complications that have to be now solved. And so by necessity, has become about 20% of my practice now in Alicante, which is a lot, you know? And that means that we have a developed expertise in angle-supported lenses, difficult to expand many times with many difficulties, are supported uh, lenses, which are the most challenging ones to expand, and a pursued chamber lenses of silicon, like the PRL and others that now have become obsolete in part, but they, they are in the patients, you know, and, and we have described and we have illustrated with videos how we can uh, approach each one of these cases in a successful way and sure. evidence-based with publications that support what we say. 
So it's, it, 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 it sounds simple. For a, for a, a poster chamber lens, either the PRL made of, of, of silicone or let's say a columnar-based Vizion ICL, those are pretty easy to remove through a standard 2.5, 2.75 incision. How do you remove iris claw lenses, especially the older generation that are not foldable? You have to make a big incision, right? Yeah, you, you need to go to the sclera. I do have a from incision. And from this front incision, then I save the sclera and then try to minimize the induction of astigmatism. At the same time, the sclera incision makes it very easy to, for the lens to slide out from the eye as far as you can detach it properly from the iris, which is the most challenging uh, condition because some of them have a perforated the iris. But yes, this is all these cases are for sclera. Then you have to know how to suture the sclera in order to minimize the astigmatism induction. Sure. And then you then you do FACO, let's say if they need cataract surgery at the same time, you do it through the same incision or you do a separate incision? No, separate incision. We close the incision, then we open as a regular uh, technique. We might use micro incision as surgery with one millimeter incisions or we go to 2.2 uh, FACO uh, uh, surgery. We do this, the, the, this, the surgery and then depending on the lens that we are going to implant, if it fits through 2.2 millimeters, then we use the 2.2 millimeter incision for the implantation. Some lenses, because of the power, should be with a larger incision. Then we don't mind to reopen the, the scar incision and to implant the lens to the scar incision. We try to minimize the incisions yeah. of the cornea. And if we need to work from the scleral twice, it doesn't matter. So it's interesting for these patients. You've had these patients in your clinic for many years. When they were younger, let's say maybe 25 years old, they got a fake eye well. That lasted them maybe 25 years, 30 years till they're 55 years old. Now they remove the fake lens, now make them pseudo fake with cataract surgery, and now you can carry them the rest of their life. So it's kind of a, a continual care of the patient, tailoring it as they get older. Absolutely true. And, and you know, this is the beauty of that because the patients are after 30 years following you and trusting in you. This is very important because you, you cannot disappoint these patients, but not only that, you need refractive precision because these patients were initially implanted because refractive purposes. So this is real refractive lens surgery. And by lensectomy means not only cataract surgery, good quality, safe, of course, for the endothelium, no complication, but, but should be refractively precise. You have to use it off or multifocal lenses depending on the convenience, depending on the patient profile, but the patients are requesting from you and are following you because you solved their problems 25, 30 years ago, and they request you to solve the problems now. This is very interesting and emotionally talking from a certain perspective, a tremendous positive impact in order to, to know that you paid your, 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 the trust that the, patient, that the patient is doing on you has to be followed by your expertise in doing this job in a proper way. So we must, as ophthalmologists, be not just a cataract surgeon or not just a refractive surgeon, but we have to do the whole spectrum. Corneal refractive surgery, phacic IOLs, refractive lens exchange, cataract surgery. We have to offer everything then. Absolutely. You know, this is why we edited, of course, nine years ago, a day, about refractive lens and a cornea surgery in our university. You can see this course, which is... 500 hours of teaching activities online in English, wow. which is refractive surgery online course, refractive surgery online course. Please go there and you will see how we, we approach this. I don't, I do think, believe me, that the, the modern uh, anterior segment surgeon is a refractive surgeon by is a must, should be an excellent lens surgeon, should use modern lenses perfectly, and should be an, in cornea as well, because cornea surgery follows many refractive patients and many refractive surgery patients like like uh, like the patients with cornea graft needs refractive surgery later on. So you have to be a comprehensive, complete uh, surgery in terms of medical education. But also even glaucoma surgeries, minimally invasive glaucoma procedures at the time of cataract surgery. You have to incorporate that as well. That's true. This is this is one thing that is expanding our, our profile. A glaucoma surgery is a specialized, sub-specialized surgery. But for cataract surgeons, this microstens and all what is the MIGS uh, technology is coming for us. You know, it is not coming for the for the glaucoma surgeon. Glaucoma surgeon has a different profile. They treat more difficult cases. They treat cases that have real disability. But we usually treat patients with ocular hypertension or early glaucoma, or patients that have three molecules uh, uh, in use when you approach cataract surgeon. This is the right moment for the right cataract surgeon to solve the right. I totally agree with you. Yes.
Wow. So that's a very interesting case. So that's the phacic lens patient who gave you the, the lensectomy plus the phacic lens removal. Tell me about another interesting case that you cover in the book. And that's very interesting, the Irish substitution, Irish reconstruction and Irish uh, substitution, you know. We, we have a, the, these two uh, approaches. One is to reconstruct the Irish, which is, can be done in case that you have no extensive atrophy, you have no, 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 no tissue that has been lost because pega cardiovascular atrophy in the, in the coronary mm -hmm. stroma. And if you don't have this, then you have to go to artificial Irish. Artificial Irish was a dream before. We had the mortar lenses no longer available, unfortunately, that were ugly but effective. Now we have foldable uh, pieces of, of Irish that you can uh, have in different colors. You have, they can have a structure, and believe me, they, they, they look very similar to the human Irish. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, you have to, to see carefully whether there is a difference. They, they are doing very well. The challenge is that you, you have the Irish with no lens sometimes, and then you have to implant a lens in the Irish to implant uh, for the, the complex. Mm -hmm. The, 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 all, all the composite that you have to do in, in the in Irish. And then you know that you have to know the technique in order to make this uh, this structure stable in the sulcus. I have implanted many of these, and you know, those that are in the casual bag, believe me, are not that much reliable. I have seen cases of me and other surgeons that with time and because the casual retraction, this, uh, this artificial is pump out from the casual bag. Oh. And then you have the problem that you have a, a, a structure in the third chamber. Uh, obviously with a tremendous negative impact on the corner and endothelium. So I prefer the sulcus approach, but suturing because they are not stable in the in the in the sulcus. And this is a very important part of the chapter. It's a new type of, of lenses. Probably you don't have this in the in the states at this moment, but you will have because these patients exist. They have a, a glare disability. They they don't uh, use the light properly. You cannot implant a modern lens in these spaces because simply talking is impossible. They don't manage the light. But once that you use this artificial iris in a proper way, you you have both one of the cosmetic part accomplished, but other you you are opening a new uh, window to to IOL implantation that really was not a possible before. And this is tricky, but works. And you have an excellent chapter written by uh, Vladimir Pfeiffer of this regard that they invite all of you to read. And this is one of the the most important parts indeed of the of the of the book indeed yes well it sounds like a fantastic chapter to understand and read for these difficult cases i didn't realize that if you put the the iris implant in the capsular bag when the bag contracts or con capsule contracts you can dislocate the iris implant so how what what suture do you use to suture gore-tex proline yeah, I, I use a uh, text is not my favorite, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> it, it is because it's bulky, number one. Second, the knots are m even more bulky, number, th number two. Number three, if you use the Hoffman pockets, they don't feel well in the pockets and the pockets mm -hmm. cannot be closed properly. So I use the proline. I have to tell you, I have had not that many problems with the proline, uh, the, no, uh, the CIF4 suture is my favorite. And, you know, if in 20 years I have to substitute it, I would do. But so far, I prefer the, the, the very uh, thin, elegant, uh, adequate needle that we have with the CIF4. And I do not use the Coretex in spite of what in the many other surgeons are using. They, it doesn't work well in my hands. I don't think that they are delicate. They are not, indeed, the caliper of a, of a, a, a of tiny suture. And I declined using them after some cases, which I ha was with inadequate knots and inadequate bulky uh, knots underneath the, underneath the, the square. So I use the, the CIF4 from Ethicon, the Prolinteno. That sounds fantastic. And that gives good long term stability. Long term stability, we know that it might, might be not good, but believe me, in my hands, has not been that much. I have been implanted for probably 15 or 20 years uh, implants with this lens. And I seldom see one case with Lucette. And if I see one case Lucette, I substitute it. It's not a problem, but I prefer that to the Voritex uh, sutures that have an inadequate needle and an inadequate caliper and, uh, for, for the purpose of my surgery. What, what advice do you give a young surgeon who's finished a residency training, finished a fellowship, but really hasn't gotten experience with these types of difficult or challenging cases? How do you go about learning them? Yes, we'll get, buy the book and read the book and... But how do you go take that book knowledge and apply it to learn it with your hands? Well, I, when you have to think how to teach and how to give a, an, an advice to a young surgeon, first think how you did it, because we sure. did it, you know. Yes. Sometimes we, we visit other surgeons, it's, it's possible. 
but sometimes if the soil is in Australia, it's impossible, it's very costly and, and it's not convenient. They then attended to seminars, seminars, historical seminars are good, and you learn a lot from what other uh, people uh, say and, and source in the seminar. What is true is that they are edited videos and sometimes they do not represent real life. I have seen a, a, a stories that were five minute stories and then when you go to the real place, it's 45 minutes and a lot of trouble. So you, you need to be aware of that. It's, uh, number three, a thing that uh, you have in the literature almost everything. Uh, for instance, in the in the book that uh, of Petra Sorry that we published with Bobby Usher and Booker Dick, we have videos because this is a good learning process. Uh, many, many surgeons from uh, Latin America, Far East, they cannot travel that much. It's very expensive and they have no accessibility to this. But in the book, you have the videos and the video links are really good. I, I have seen many of your videos excellent and they are produced in a didactical way. It tells you, tells you about what you have to learn from the shortly. So my, my advice is, please try to see first what you want to do. Second, prepare your surgery. Surgery has to be prepared. You have to, to, to make a plan, you know. You have to make that strategy and to have a plan A and a plan B because sometimes plan A is not feasible and you cannot start thinking what to do in, in the operating room. So prepare your surgeries. And number three, based on evidence. For instance, okay. there, there is a controversy now about whether to use the, the, the scratch suture lenses or the uh, or the artisan lens uh, on the, behind the iris. Uh, right. the, the, okay, this, this controversy needs to be cleared, you know, because at this moment uh, the surgery with the artisan is very, very fast. But on the other hand, uh, you have, uh, you are exposed to other complications and the lens can luxate with time as well. I have seen lenses luxated with time in the anterior chamber. Why not in the posterior chamber? We need a study like this. And if you base in evidence your choice, you are going to be with a extremely a, a successful surgeon for the future of your patients, which is the fact. Don't, don't think in the short term, think in the, in the long term as well. Yeah, so it's interesting. So a lot of times we're used to doing things only on anecdotal evidence. Well, on my experience, well, my experience. But you're saying it's much more important to actually do it evidence-based. Let's look at it. Let's study the patients. Let's do a trial. Let's figure out the true answer. Yeah, okay. we, we are doctors and that means that we have the science of medicine. Uh, the, the art uh, was uh, separated from, from science when uh, Koch defined demonstration. So demonstration is when somebody else can do what you do with the same result. Evidence-based means you are using a technique that is not the art of a surgeon or is a, a, a crazy idea or it's anecdotal information. It's reproductible if your reproductibility is mandatory in science and you have to see that the, doc, the, the surgeon that advise you to do something has peer-reviewed publications. Peer-reviewed publications means serious doctor, serious doctor because you are getting your data, you are analyzing your outcomes, you refer your outcomes to others, and then others make, uh, uh, make uh, pay attention to what which have been your results and uh, uh, agree with the publication. This is a percolated information. Go evidence-based, don't go heart-based, and not uh, far less emotional-based, okay? No, that's a very good point. Now, speaking of peer-reviewed journals and peer-reviewed articles, I cannot believe how many peer-reviewed articles you have produced. It must be a thousand. It's some un incredibly high number. Every uh, over eight hundred. Yes. Eight. Oh, wow. That's that's as much as you know. Twenty really prolific ophthalmologists will do eight hundred total, forty each. Right. Wow. That's a, so. Tell me, you built up a whole team here. Your clinic. You've built into a huge, big uh, empire, basically. How did you get just? How did you get started, and how did you grow it? Well, you know, this is uh, the, the story of my life. You know, I, I became chairman of ophthalmology very young because in Spain there's an open competition, and then you show that you have the capabilities, you have the background, and you have and you have to go through a, a very complex exam. Then you are appointed, and then when I arrived in Alicante. I was not from Alicante at all. I was educated in Madrid and actually I, I, I was a, I, I was both my, my original country is not Spain even, you know. But then when I arrived, the problem and the advantage was the same. I was very young. At the same time, I had no infrastructure. And so I had time to develop a new structure. It was the youngest university in Spain and they allowed me to, to start an American project because basically what I did is, has been made in most of the important institutions, Bas Compartment, Johns Hopkins, they all these institutes started with a, with a person 
a visionary person thinking in the future, putting their money, investing and creating value and creating talent. And this is what I started with my colleagues and my collaborators. And finally, uh, because I thought that the way to develop medicine and develop my academic career couldn't be in the old standards. New standards means investment. New standards means technology. New standards means renovation, you know. And you cannot depend on decisions of persons that takes one year to decide that a new instrument has to be purchased for the benefit of the patient that you know that works. So I, I became, with the agreement of the university, independent in taking this decision. The investment was made <clears throat> by me. And finally, we did a continuous reinvestment of our revenues in order to create larger value. Now we are, a, with a, obviously, a very stable condition. We belong to a corporation. And this corporation is not only in Spain, but also in Europe. It's called Biomed. And it's the most important and, and extensive uh, ophthalmic uh, organization in Europe. So innovation, <clears throat> investment, quick decisions for uh, following evidence or following signs. Sometimes you don't have the evidence, uh, but you, you know that this can be true. And then you have to, to, to program a research and clinical research brings the evidence necessary for innovation to be, to have credit. And this is the way in which we created papers. I, I, I am very good in writing papers. Going to the States, I can write one paper going there and one more coming <laughs> in. <laughs> so you, you, I, yeah. you, don't sleep, you don't sleep on the airplane. You write a paper. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 if I have the data and I have the literature, I can write the paper straightforward. And evidence-based means analysis of your resource. This is a way in which we have created our structure, evidence-based, demonstration, new technology and new ideas new ideas that come with you or come to you you sure. can you, you can be, be you, you can develop the idea but many times this idea for instance on you uh, Uday, that gives to me an advice or uh, i see you and then this it makes inspiration inspiration makes creativity but creativity is not to paint uh, something it's, it's to create a value for your patient and then you have to follow the rules of clinical research because it has to be well organized. You have to cooperate with the industry. The industry is a key factor in our development because the industry obviously wants to, to be uh, successful and to, uh, to get money, but they, they are helping us constantly. You know, without the, the industry, we couldn't do what we do today. So I, I work uh, with the industry a lot. I appreciate a lot the support. Believe me, in my many years of collaboration, believe me, I have never had an ethical problem with any company. If I had bad results, they were bad. If they were good results, they were good. I have to say that we have very reliable industry and they are very respectful with medical science. And that's that's my point. So this is how we created the clinics, we created the, organ the organization from scratch, from nothing. And finally, we have created an um, international corporation and we have published at the same time a papers that bring scientific value of what we do. And it sounds like all of it is about putting the patient first. What is best for the patient? Exactly. This is the point because finally we are doctors, vocational doctor. I'm vocational doctor. I became a doctor and the first of my family and family didn't want me to be a doctor. They thought that I could have a better and more successful career, less time consuming in other areas. But I am vocational doctor since very, very young. And believe me, I think it's the best profession we can have. We are working for in, in our hobby. So ophthalmology yes. is my hobby. I'm, I never tire because I, I think that you are tired of something that you don't enjoy, believe me. That's absolutely true. Here on Cataract Coach, a lot of our viewers are younger, let's say age 30 to 50, and a lot of them are trying to decide, should they do academic world of ophthalmology, the private clinic world of ophthalmology, maybe government hospital? How, you have experience in everything. How do, how do, you, how do they decide what's best? Well, I am an academic uh, doctor because my father was a philosophy teacher. So I have been in academics uh, deeply influenced by my father, not because he wanted me to be a, an academic doctor. He didn't want me to be a doctor, even, but because I, I, I really realized the value and the, and the essence of teaching. Teaching means to, 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 to learn. Teaching means to learn yourself first, to teach the others. And this is the way in which I became an uh, academic doctor. I think academic doctor is, is the most attractive career because it is you are a doctor you apply your science you analyze your resource and you create science and finally you educate in the science to the others so it's, it's a full cycle obviously others can have a different approach 
can have a different education, a different culture, and you can be a purely professional a doctor, fully devoted to your patients and to your personal issues. Sometimes you can be a, an entrepreneur and to, and to be a business doctor as well. I don't like that that much, you know. Uh, thinking only money is not the way to create good medicine. Good medicine means uh, spending money sometimes and to lose money, but finally you, you gain money because you have better results. And all this this scope and, and complex things, so essential uh, things, makes made me to be academic doctor entering into business as well. Because you cannot understand our uh, society without, without business. Business is the way to move ahead. You cannot depend only on grants. You cannot depend on on supplies that comes from third parts. You need to create your own resources. And if you believe in what you do, to apply this uh, this income to your resources makes a lot of value for you obviously and this is how a medical education should include a business education i i, I mm. have seen many many times in the medical school we need to have a a, 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 a part a, a number of credits devoted to a, in the, a education for doctors in business business education means how to analyze accountability how to to analyze what is value, value created you should not be an economist, but you need to understand what is a business inside. And this is something that may, makes a lot of uh, credits and, uh, and my opinion will be sure. like a mini MBA for doctors. I mean, it's part of education that we miss. I had to learn all of this by myself, making mistakes obviously many times, but the, the, we include medical education in, in our medical school, a mini MBA on, on medical practice and business. It should be of tremendous value for all our students when finishing the, the career that have to face a, a, a real world where economy works based on business, investment, revenue. Yeah, that's a very important thing because you're correct. We don't teach anything in business in medical school or even in residency or ophthalmology fellowship. There's almost zero business learning. But if you don't have a successful business, you can't take care of your patients. Obviously, you, you can be not do, doing well with your practice. Your practice can be a not successful because of you and because of your lack of education in business, which is a, a very important uh, and negative issue in our education. So I, with those uh, colleagues that are seen to us and they are doing enough, try to get a mini MBA. MBA takes a lot of time and probably you are in a business practice, you can't take that, but you can devote two, three months to an MBA uh, part-time, for instance, four hours a day, and this will, in my opinion, increase your practice will increase your knowledge about what is the real world uh, in the practice. And basically, if you are entering private practice, it's mandatory to do it. Mandatory. That's Yeah, that's very interesting. What do you think is the future coming for us in cataract surgery? Will we ever get an accommodating lens? Will we get more precision and in, in cal IOL calculations? What's coming for us in the future, do you think? Yeah, you know, the future is, is here. Okay. I think that we are at the end of a process in which we had first monofocal lenses, then primitive multifocals, and more developed multifocals, and we had different types of multifocals. Finally, we have five types, <clears throat> five types of depth lenses, but the final goal is accommodation. Accommodation is not has not been accomplished yet. The, the, most of the accommodating lenses that have been offered have been fake news sometimes, unfortunately, mm -hmm. but we have been working for 18 years in accommodating lens, which is based in the sulcus, which is quite an innovation. <clears throat> we have published several papers on this in American Journal of Ophthalmology, ERS, you can go through that to, with my name. And this lens works. We have experimental animal work in monkeys. And then we have clinical cases in phase three that demonstrates that we have an accommodated lens that moves in the circus. Once that we have a lens that can adapt to the distance without multifocality, without glare, without the photo phenomena, really this will make the final change in the IOL surgery because the accommodation is what we look for. The, at this moment, <clears throat> this lens should be at the sulcus because the back is an inadequate place for an uh, accommodated lens because it's a membrane. But a membrane, once that is empty, it lacks of any anatomical value, anatomical uh, meaning, mm. and then becomes fibrotic. Like, and becomes fibrotic means no elasticity and the lens cannot move. In the sulcus is different. And if you look to our experimental animal studies, <clears throat> you can see that the five years, the forces generated in the inside body still can move properly unless implanted in the sulcus. And this is what we have been focused on. The, 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 so lenses, accommodated lenses are 
in the future, you know. But still, we are at the beginning, but at the end process of a long time development with monofocus and multifocus and recently you know. Then the, uh, we still have punctual uh, catastrophe. Still today we have to open 2.2, but you know that we do, some of us, sorry through one millimeter, the idea will be at 23 gates, like in vitrectomy. Oh, <coughs> by, by manual. Exactly, by, by, by manual with uh, adequate energy that makes you to be feel comfortable because should not be an art for some soldiers, should be a science for all doctors that want to learn it properly. And then to to, to eliminate the, the everything that we have cataract or lens surgery without a cataract will be much more safe, will be much more controllable. Probably we shall make less negative effect at the vitreous, which is the main problem with the cooperate a young person of, of cataract because the vitreous is attached. And finally, we can implant a lens that should be adaptable to this uh, size, injected in the in whatever, in my opinion, this one is uh, the surplus, might be that the future this dream of having a, a, a product at a, a material in mean, the casual bag seal I'm working will be will be feasible. I, I do think that will be feasible. And this the uh, a, a new technology that was with an old idea being successful. And finally, we have obviously the the the, the, arcos. the arcos of the patients are refractive. And uh, this refractive precision you pointed out is very important. We we have <clears throat> the, this interoperative uh, aura uh, technologies that in Europe has not been that popular, you know, because even that you can analyze what, what is the outcome, you know that the predictability of, th of the second or, th or first month will not be exactly that. So we need to, to, to create probably an artificial intelligence system to tell us which are the variables that are not calculate, not possible to be calculated that make us with the, all the analytical biometrical methods that we have to finish in that perfect adapted uh, lens optical power to be a proper uh, adequate for the purpose of the lens that we implanted. And finally, no drops. I think that dropless mm. uh, sorry is the I, I'm, I'm doing that now. You know, I <clears throat> I use intra intraocular uh, storage low de low degree. I have the blow out totally macular edema from my practice. Uh, obviously, antibiotics are necessary for five days, but what, what, what a tremendous step forward. The patients leave our uh, recovery room with no drops because mo many of them are elderly. Many of them will not use the drops properly. Many of them will not have anybody to, to put the drops in their eyes sure. and they make mistakes. So I think that problems that are surgery is part of the future that is coming. So accumulative lenses, Micro incision are sorry, minimizing the incision to the level of one millimeter, 20, 23, 25 gauge, and a droplet surgery is something that we shall see, in my opinion, in the coming five years in our practices. Wow, that's amazing. Now, we used to do 10, 15 years ago, there was a popularity of bimanual cataract surgery, where the, in, the, in the left hand, let's say you had an irrigating chopper, in the right hand, you had a phaco needle with no sleeve. And that was two incisions about a millimeter each. Why didn't that gain more popularity? Why did we go back to coaxial? Yeah, well, I, I was one of the, of the of the guys moving this ahead. You know, we had a lens that that was thin optics that we rolled the lens in our fingers and we implanted it through one millimeter. So this was feasible at that moment. That that was the popularity at that moment. The problem is that thin optics didn't work well optically. And finally, the company disappeared, but the patterns are still in an important company, which is Boston. Let's see what happens in the future. But what is true is that if you cannot start and finish the cataract procedure through the same incision, many surgeons are discouraged. Many surgeons think that, well, to run through a new training program, learning how to do micro incision, learning how to use the ultrasound or lasers, because lasers were available at that moment, not working well, but, they, but could, could work in the future. But to open again to, for three millimeter lens for a 2.2, better to go through a 2.2 from the beginning and finish. This is the point that made mm -hmm. this discovery not to be a successful, was successful, but was not popular. Popular because it's more difficult. If, the, if you cannot finish the story through the same incision, that means that you break the concept again. And finally, this is coming, a big, I'm sure, in any future in which we can have this lens again, implantable for one millimeter, in the sulcus, in the back, or any place, accommodative or enough. And this is the, 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 the progress that will make, again, a revival of micro incision surgery in, the, in this coming five to six years. The, the, the lens will move the topic, not the surgery. Surgery is done, so we know how to do it. 
we need the range to go to one point. But it's interesting is the same surgeons who say, well, if you have to make an incision for the lens anyway, I'll just use that. They also sometimes do bimanual irrigation aspiration. So they already, ha they already have the two bimanual incisions and the fake the main incision for the lens. Exactly. You are the surgeon and you know that with bimanual you reach 360 degrees with a cortex removal, a epithelial cell removal, you want to, to remove them. You have access to all the eye. To do 2.2, you have a fixed finger in the eye that is not that elegant, the middle view. And finally, you don't have mobility. So definitely bimanual is better. Bimanual is better, but we don't have the bimanual technique at this moment much with the adequate lens to convince the surgeons, sure. the yeah. surgeons to go through. For the accommodating lens, how many diopters of accommodation do we need? Two, three, four, five, how many diopters do we need? You know, we need a, <clears throat> to, to be spectacular independent three diopters. To be spectacular independence in the long term, we need more because accommodative fatigue is a function that needs to be a, a, mm. a accomplished in a, in a more poor. The real thing is that we cannot get that much today. You know, the, we had a lens that was the new, the new lens uh, created uh, with a, a friend, Joshua Bendun in Israel. We got up to eight diopters, but it was with a material that was not compatible with human implantation. And so we, 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 we declined to develop that. But that, that demonstrated to us that we could get up to six or eight diopters of accommodation with adequate materials. What we get now, with a with a lens with the luminal lens, which is the one that I use and I I have been developing uh, along the last 18 years with the Aconex company, is about three diopters maximum. Three diopters is enough or not? Well, let me tell you that phase three study of our patients are spectacularly independent, happy, and we have engineers, we have doctors, doctors, colleagues, mm. non ophthalmologists yet, but the colleagues, <laughs> and we have very very. Uh, uh, the, the devoted patients to office work and they are spectacularly independent. The, 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 the lens now with one to three doctors works well, but we have discovered that we have some cell accommodation in, in code in the lens. We are still investigating why and how this cell accommodation works because it's not a need of effect like the ones that we have now in the market, it's a different one, but probably it's a new type of, of optical behavior. That this accommodating lens, at least the, the Lumina, has to, uh, to, uh, to, to add a value to the real accommodation to get this excellent result, in which makes the patients to be very independent. And believe me, this is something that has been published. The, the new paper is being produced now with a phase three study, and the lens will be, it's, it's already with CMR, and will be available, I hope, uh, more or less at the end of this year or beginning of next year. Oh, Thank fantastic. You. And this is curvature changing then. No, it, it is true, uh, based on Albert's principle, two sinusoidal uh, uh, surfaces, uh, body focal, when sliding one into the other, moved by the axillary body, creates a continuous chase in the power of the lens. Oh. So they are two sinusoidal frontal plane, they're not moving backwards and forward. It's a totally different concept. It's a Albert's principle. Albert's principle uh, merits the Nobel Prize in 1953. Wow. And the base of all automatic refractors. Auto, auto refractors have been based in this principle, and especially subjective auto refractors have been all made in this in this technology. So you're able to harness that power from the ciliary body, the ciliary muscle, to Correct. get the movement. Ciliary body circular, so the yeah. forces are generated in a centripetal way. Yes. And you need, you have one lens that is like one into the other. So it's a dual lens, but there are two body focal surfaces sliding one into the other creating a continuous change in the power of the, of the lens and the power of the eye. Well, that's fantastic. What a brilliant idea. I like the idea. Like, like an autorefractor. Nobel Prize idea. <laughs> yeah, obviously. Now tell me, uh, for your dropless regimen, so no more drops, what medications are you putting? How are you delivering them? Is it subtenons, intracameral, intravitreal? Where are you doing these medicines? You know, I use, uh, well, I, I participate in the ESRAs, a, a, a ciproprocessing study, you know, and so I, from, I was at that moment attracted already by the idea of putting in the third chamber of 0.1% of roxime in order to avoid the endothermitis. The, and the demonstration was obvious. We de decreased 15 times less uh, the frequency of, uh, of the, the endothermitis. And now, where we use is the same, we use the full roxime, bigamos as well. Bigamos is an off label use, as you know. But it works. And so with this, the issue is, do we need drops in the post-op? Medical legally, 
probably yes, because we have to educate our our society that this is safe. But what I do is I use the, the furoxyme impregnated incisions. <clears throat> so I'm hydrating incisions with the furoxyme, and at the end I I, I put 1.2 cc in the third chamber. In doing that, you have a minimum uh, MIC uh, uh, deposit of the furoxyme that lasts for the first 24 hours. And you have, a, the, a, because of the clearance of the aqueous is faster, the clearance of the aqueous makes to be about one hour with MC, MIC, useful in the third chamber. That means the only place the, through which a, the, a micro can enter in the eye is through the incisions. You have 24 hours, the protection of the, of the incision with the, with the furosine or bigamos, that's fine. This is <clears throat> something that makes you to be in the safe area as far as you don't have leakage. <clears throat> I don't think that modern operating rules have any uh, any possibility to have a real contamination today. You don't break the rule. But you have patients that have leakage. This small leakage can lead to a contamination in the post-op in the first 24 hours. So this is why we use the incision, uh, antibiotic impregnation, and hydration for that. And second, we use 10% transinolone diluted in the third chamber, just 0.1. And this transinolone is a kind of cloudiness at the, at the beginning, but finally, in 12 hours, <clears throat> it is in the R scripts, and from there it lasts six weeks. Believe me, it works very well. You don't have any inflammation, but moreover, you don't see macular edema in my patients, have virtually disappeared unless you have complications. Normal cases, we have no complications now with macular edema. Obviously, this is preliminary information, has not uh, the peer review evidence, but is what I'm doing in order to move ahead this robust uh, idea. I don't like uh, non steroids and I, I have uh, no use of that. So basically, what I see now is an steroid uh, um, <clears throat> slow release for six weeks that has in a minimal concentration enough to, to control the very low degree of inflammation that we have in the post-op, antibiotic in a way that will protect the patient for 24, 14 hours, and that's it, you know, and the patients in this way are less affected by the lack of compliance, less affected by to ocular toxicity, and they don't touch the eyes, especially because many elderly patients, when they are putting their drops, they touch yeah. the eyes and they open the incision sometimes. This is the point, you know. So it's cefuroxime, usually, or sometimes Vigamox, intracameral 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 um, cc's one, of 1%. And then you're also using that same solution to do hydration of the corneal incisions to seal them and also act as like a slow release over the first 24 hours. And then inside the eye for the steroid is triamcinolone, uh, 10 milligrams per cc, and then you're doing a total of one milligram, 0 0.1 cc's? Open one, open one. So it's, it's, a, it's a mini flux. It's, it's really very low, very low amount. 0 0.1, 0 0.5, 1.5 is what I, what I do. 0 0.1 is very low quantity, but it's enough to, and 10% is extremely low. I don't see ocular hypertension. I might be lucky so far, but this uh, this brings to me an excellent post-op with a very good uh, uh, patient satisfaction and, you know, silent eye, white eye, nothing, you know, it's, it's, it, yeah. Believe me, it's feasible to have this type of therapy. I know the limitations because of the FDA and many, many pharmacological controls, but uh, many times you have pioneer idea that they, this needs years to develop. But drug surgery is completely affordable, it's cheap, it's better for the patients, it's much more reliable, and finally you get better outcomes. And even though the anterior chamber turns over so quickly, every, let's say, every 90 minutes, 100 minutes, you still have enough of the particles in the iris crypts that it stays active for a long time. Because they are particles, they are, they are not a, a solvent, they are particles, and they are suspension. A suspension uh, is uh, once that you put they, it is deposit. The deposit is created in the R scripts. Actually, the next day you seldom see anything or small uh, dust on the lens and disappears. But that makes a difference, you know. Probably the, the amount that is left is enough for the purpose. It's, 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 it's empirical, but it's working. But the source attention, this should not be solutions, should be suspensions. And suspensions are kept in the eye in microparticles not observable, they don't interfere with the vision, and the patients are polemic, totally covered. We should also say, though, your patients have very little inflammation. You are a, I've seen you do live surgery. You are a fantastic surgeon. 
So your surgeries are very brief, very minimal invasive, very delicate, very gentle to the tissues. If you're a young doctor just starting off and you've done less than a thousand cataracts, you may need a little bit more inflammation control. I agree. You know, it, it, this is not, not to be adopted today. But, you know, it, it, new ideas have to be used by those that really are capable to use them properly and followed by clinical research. So I think that information is what we need and to have the concept that droplet surgery is feasible. It's not here today, sure. but will, will happen in the future. One millimeter incision lenses are not here today, but were in the past and will be in the future. And this is the, the really the, 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 the point and the driving force that we have to move into a better type of surgery and better outcomes in it. Now that I have become presbyopic with the gray hair, I would love to have my accommodation returned to me. Yeah, well, this is also pharmacology, you know. I'm very, very interested in pharmacology of presbyopia. And you know, there has, has been a very large move in the States, especially along this topic. I'm using drops for my early presbyopic patients successfully. In, in my wife, I have to tell you that she's... What, really what are the drops? You What's know, the I, drops? I use, I use the, the Bejarano, Felipe Bejarano, Colombian uh, colleague, a, a patented uh, a combination of, of drops, of, 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 of molecules that makes not the people to be very myotic, but moderately myotic or even nothing, but creates a tonic uh, ciliary body. And with this, one diopter, 1.5 can be accomplished. And many young people, young is 45, you know, they, yeah. 45, they are young. They, they love it, you know, and I think that pharmacology or presbyopia deserves that it's probably other, other molecules not myotic, uh, like um, not, not to mention any special one, but uh, this uh, the, the pharmacology of uh, of the drugs that we used in the past <clears throat> for glaucoma, uh, like carbacoline, is uh, that they are working very well because they move the ciliary body without creating meiosis. Meiosis is one of the ways to create and improving the vision, but also you you move the ciliary body. And some, uh, some people don't like them because of the theoretical resolutely and attachment. I think that this is very theoretical, but cannot be ruled out. Those that are not working on the mice definitely are, in my opinion, the ones that will be much more acceptable and commercial in the future. But I, I, do, I do believe that this is a move for the future for patients as well. Wow, yeah. It's an exciting time to be an ophthalmologist. You have so many innovations on so many different fronts. I think want to read this, this mixture of, of molecules, read my papers, click Presbyopia uh, Pharmacological Treatment, and you will read uh, three papers on this, in which we describe the, the, the product, we describe the, the outcomes, we describe the, the immediate outcomes in three hours, and basically you have a flavor about what we are talking about. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic time to be an ophthalmologist. I'm like you. Every day I'm thankful that I'm an ophthalmologist, and my work as an ophthalmologist, it's a pleasure. It's my hobby. I do it for fun. Exactly. How, how, how happy we are because of that. Otherwise, not worth it, you know, because we are 12 hours a day nonstop, and this is something because you have enjoyed. If you don't enjoy it, leave it. That's true. That's true. Well, I want to thank you for being on our podcast. I learned so much from you. I also know you had a very busy day in clinic, and now it's finally time for your, your, your dinner. And I want to remember now, next time I'm on a long flight, and I'm watching the movie or taking a nap, I'm going to think, Professor Alia would be writing a paper right now. <laughs> True. I never, I never watch movies in, in, in their play. But it's, it's, it's very good. You are concentrated, you are alone, and you can do it. That sounds fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Professor Alia, and thank you for enjoying our Cataract Coach podcast. We're going to have a new one every week with more interesting guests, who are going to tell you about their journey in ophthalmology and what they think the future holds for all of us. I know you'll enjoy it. See you next time.